You're probably watching this because you or someone you know has been diagnosed with head and neck cancer. This video will hopefully answer a few of those questions you may have about the next steps of treatment. This video will describe a typical journey for someone diagnosed with head and neck cancer in the UK. However, it is important to note that every person's journey will be different and might vary from what's described in this video. First of all, it's worth noting that nobody will go through this journey alone. Anyone on this journey will usually have a dedicated clinical nurse specialist who will be their point of contact and knowledge. Your journey will usually start through a referral from your GP or dentist who has noticed an abnormality through a routine checkup, or via a follow-up appointment after which you'll be invited to an outpatient appointment at a hospital but not stay overnight. At the first appointment, the consultant or his team will take what is known as a medical history. This is essentially an overview of your medical past and your lifestyle. They will also ask you what, about what support you have in the community. Routine blood tests, x-rays and other basic tests may be carried out on the same day. In addition, typically the scans will be scheduled and a date for a biopsy set. Scanning can help to diagnose the cancer, find out what stage it's at so doctors know how big it is and whether the cancer has spread to other parts of the body. This will then help to determine the best treatment options for you. When you arrive at the hospital for your scan, your radiographer may ask you to change into a hospital gown. You'll have to remove any jewellery and metal objects as metal interferes with the images produced by the scanner. You'll be called into the scanning room and asked to lie, usually on your back, on the scanning couch. Once you're in the right position, your radiographer joins the room adjacent to the scanner, but is visible through a large glass window. The scanner itself is large and shaped like a donut and it may feel a little claustrophobic once inside. The radiographer will be in communication with you at all times through the scan, which will take 15 minutes or longer. There are four different types of scan. The first type is known as a PET scan. PET stands for Positron Emission Tomography. Any dietary guidelines will be highlighted on your appointment letter that you should follow. About an hour before the scan, you'll be injected with a dye, also known as a radio tracer, through a small needle in your arm. The dye helps to visualise specific parts of the body based on their chemical activity. The scan itself is not particularly noisy, but you'll hear a constant background noise. If you are given medicine to help you relax, you may still be drowsy and will need someone to take you home. The second type of scan is known as a CT scan, which uses x-rays to take detailed pictures of your body from different angles. A computer then puts them together to create a 3D image, giving a very accurate picture of where an abnormal area such as a cancer is and how big it is. The third type of scan is an MRI scan, which uses electromagnetic rays to build an image. This scan can be quite noisy, but earplugs may be made available. The last scan type is known as an ultrasound scan and is like the scans carried out in pregnancy. This may give particular advantages over some of the other scans and may be requested by your consultant. It may be combined with a test to assess some of the cells or tissues in parts of the body to help with the diagnosis. This test is called fine needle aspiration or a core biopsy which simply involves the use of a hollow needle to collect the sampled cells for microscopic examination. In addition to the scans, your consultant will have scheduled a biopsy to help with the diagnosis of cancer. During the biopsy, a surgeon may remove a small piece of tissue from the abnormal area. This sample is examined under the microscope. If the biopsy contains cancerous cells, it can show the type and how slowly or quickly it may grow also known as a grade. The biopsy is also useful to determine a person's overall prognosis, also known as their outlook. 
Biopsies can be carried out under local anaesthetic, you're awake and the area where the biopsy is taken from is numbed, or general anaesthetic, when you're asleep. This is determined by the accessibility of the possible cancer and whether you can tolerate the biopsy whilst awake. If the biopsy is carried out under local anaesthetic, you don't usually have to starve yourself and you won't need to stay in hospital overnight. But if your procedure is carried out under general anaesthetic, you will get instructions on when to last eat and drink. You may need to stay overnight. You may require stitches to the site of the biopsy and experience some discomfort after. This may require simple painkillers. Occasionally you may experience some intermittent bleeding from the biopsy site. It usually takes about a week to get the biopsy results back and you will review these and your scan results in the consultant's clinic. You, with your biopsy and scan results, will be discussed in the multidisciplinary head and neck cancer meeting. At the meeting there will be oncologists, surgeons, radiologists, pathologists, dentists, speech and language therapists, specialist nurses and dietitians. A treatment plan will be recommended, but your views will also be taken into consideration. There are a number of options available that could make up your treatment plan. Currently these include surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy and immunotherapy. These could be used alone or in combination depending on the diagnosis of your cancer. The exact location, aggressiveness, size etc and your wishes will all influence the decisions made by your doctors. In most cases, surgery is used to remove the tumour. In some cases the tumour is partially removed when full removal might damage an organ or the body. Removing part of a tumour can also help other treatments work better. Radiotherapy uses high energy rays to treat disease. It can be given both internally and externally. Internal radiotherapy involves having radioactive material placed inside the body, whereas external radiotherapy aims high energy rays at the affected area using a large machine. Radiotherapy works by destroying cancer cells in the area that's been treated, and unlike normal cells, these are not able to repair themselves after radiotherapy, but normal cells usually can. The type of radiotherapy you're given will depend on the type of cancer you have and your individual situation. You can be given radiotherapy for different reasons, and it may be given in combination with other treatments, such as surgery or chemotherapy. Chemotherapy uses anti-cancer drugs to destroy cancer cells. These drugs disrupt the way cancer cells grow and divide, but they also affect normal cells. Chemotherapy can be administered in different ways depending on the type of cancer being treated and the chemotherapy drugs being used. Different chemotherapy drugs affect the cancer cells in different ways and are selected on a case-by-case -case basis, which includes considerations of temporary side effects and more. Unlike normal cells, cancerous cells eventually die because they can't repair the damage caused by chemotherapy. Sometimes chemotherapy is used alone but can often be used in combination with other treatments such as surgery and radiotherapy. Immunotherapies harness the body's own immune system to recognise and fight cancer by destroying the tumour cells using the body's own defence system. Immunotherapy is routinely given intravenously. Radiotherapy, chemotherapy and immunotherapy may all have side effects and your specialist will discuss these with you. Once treatment is started you'll be given a specific follow-up plan depending on your treatment type to monitor the evolution of the cancer going forward. Hopefully this has given you an overview of what a person diagnosed with head and neck cancer can expect and what the initial phase of that journey could look like. Remember, you can always reach out to your medical professional for more information.